Hi, um, thank you. So I am Regis James. I have been working at Regeneron as a bioinformatics staff scientist for the past few years. And before that, I got my PhD in computational biology from Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. So before I get started, I just want to say thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me to give this keynote talk. It's pretty meaningful that the knowledge that I've gained over the years is something that has been asked to be shared with the greater community around the world. So in today's talk, I'll be discussing Intermap, which is an integrative multi-omics approach to generating target hypotheses. So this is the end point here. I'm just gonna start at the end so that everyone knows where I'm going. This is a Shiny app, it's an interface that um, I built with my team and it's an optimized way of generating and ranking and filtering therapeutic target hypotheses. Um, and it generates this integrated list of target hypotheses within a couple seconds. You may already be wondering what exactly does Regis mean by target hypotheses? I'll get into that in a second. But first, let's go all the way back to the beginning and discuss how we got here and how you can as well. And so to do this, I will be breaking this talk down into three different sections. So first I'll be discussing the goals and challenges of a pharmaceutical company. And then I'll be discussing a data-driven approach for overcoming these obstacles using R. And then lastly, I'll be going into an example case study with this approach. It's a fabricated one, so it's not exactly anything that we are actually looking into. But I thought it would be a great example to help people understand the power of this type of approach. So for the goals and challenges, for a pharmaceutical company. And this is an incomplete list, but the first thing is to discover therapeutic treatment approach hypotheses. Uh, then to develop and hone these treatments to maximize their potency, safety, and scalability, and then deliver these optimized treatments to patients as efficiently as possible, which in a nutshell is an effort to heal the world. That's what we do in pharmaceutical companies. Now, I keep mentioning this therapeutic treatment hypothesis. And what exactly do I mean by that? Well, it, in an oversimplified way, we already are all aware of the notion of a disease or a phenotypic presentation. And then you have this molecular abnormality, which I'll call a mechanism that causes, if not remedied, this disease, this phenotypic presentation. But if a pharmaceutical company can come up with an intervention technique, a method that can target and in doing so attempt to remedy the mechanism, then it can prevent the disease. So the hypothesis is that if you prevent the mechanism using this method, then you can prevent the disease. And what pharmaceutical companies are really looking for are the ones that have the best chance of actually helping people. And that actually is pretty key. Um, and so what do I mean by that? Well, so let's say, for example, that we've got one method that targets one mechanism. It, it blocks that mechanism, which would otherwise cause disease B. Well, there are others as well. So we may have, even after filtering to what's currently known, another method that can target another mechanism that causes another disease. Or um, the same method, so method number two, can cause a different, can target a different mechanism, which if not remedied would cause another disease. Um, or you can also have another method that targets the same mechanism that can cause multiple diseases. You can even have the same mechanism, the molecular abnormality, causing multiple different types of diseases or phenotypic representations. Um, and this can go on and on and on. But fortunately, some of these hypotheses, the method targeting the mechanism to remedy and prevent the disease, some of them have weak links in what is being posited meaning that they may be able to be eliminated so that a pharmaceutical company can focus on the therapeutic hypotheses that actually have the best chance of treating the phenotypes that are presented by patients suffering from these disease. So then the question becomes, well, then how do we decide which hypotheses to consider adding to the R&D pipeline? Um, so we can have a, a course filter that we apply to the method, the mechanism, and the disease concepts. So first of all, for example, the method needs to be accessible by the pharmaceutical company in the first place. If you can't even use the method for patent reasons or whatever, then you can't even do anything about it. 
Um, and then also you must be able to understand the method well enough so that you can use it consistently and then yield consistent results. It must not it must also not generate undesired phenotypes when used to target the phenotypic or sorry the molecular abnormality the target mechanism and and apologize for the train that you may hear in the background but I'm based in New York and the Grand Central train runs periodically um, but early awareness of potential undesired phenotypes in either a model organism that you use to study the disease in-house or in the patients when treated in clinical trials Early awareness of these undesired phenotypes is important because it can also help to identify uh, therapeutic hypotheses that can be eliminated as early as possible from consideration. Now, in terms of the mechanism, the mechanism must be targetable by the intervention method. If you have a great method and you have access to it, but then that method doesn't really work on that mechanism, again, that's not something that you can do about it. And even if it does work, there can be varying degrees of effectiveness of the method in terms of targeting and attempting to remedy the mechanism. Um, it must also be simple enough to recapitulate this mechanism, this molecular abnormality, within a laboratory environment so that it can be studied and treated. Now, in terms of the disease, it must be feasible to generate a viable model of this disease that enables the testing of the intervention method on remedying the mechanism that causes the disease. It must also be detectable in the model, the animal model, more than likely, that's generated in a, in a pharmaceutical company so that you can see that the phenotypes that uh, the disease encapsulates are present. And then when the method targets the mechanism to prevent the disease, when those phenotypes are removed, there should also be possibility of observing those phenotypes as well. But even after you apply this manual filtration, this coarse filtration, there still remain too many options. So in terms of methods, there are a variety of ways that mechanisms can be addressed. In terms of mechanisms, there are a variety of ways that molecular abnormalities can manifest themselves in the form of macroscopic phenotypes, genomic aberrations, transcriptomic, proteomics, envirome, the list goes on and on. And so in terms of diseases, there are also a wide range of categories that also can occur within patients. So this isn't even an exhaustive list, but in short, it means that the amount of testable options can far outweigh the amount of resources that are available. And by resources, I mean time, funding, and personnel. It's literally just impossible to investigate everything. So what we actually need is a better way to decide which hypotheses to investigate and which ones are not necessarily sufficiently causal and ad addressable that they would be able to make it through the pharmaceutical pipeline within a given pharmaceutical companies. And we need to accelerate the identification and elimination of these less viable options. And well, since there are many tools of choice that we can use, but we in this conference are experts in the use of R to address these types of problems, we want to try to eliminate these less viable op hypotheses using R. Now, what exactly does that mean in practice? Well, decision making, deciding which hypotheses to move forward with and which ones to not move forward with, is simply just decision making in terms of reducing the ambiguity. And, and one could argue that all decision making is just reducing ambiguity um, on, in terms of the different options so that which ones you need are the most clear. So what do I mean by that? So if you are thinking which road to go down, right? You have your classic fork in the road. But if you don't know anything about the left path and you don't know anything about the right path, then you might have too much ambiguity and too little clarity. And so this too much ambiguity yields low confidence, which is too little justification to go with the right road or the left road, which means that the confidence does not pass the decision threshold. Um, and this decision threshold is informed and influenced by how much the decision matters, how much harm or benefit can come from making one decision or the other. If the decision doesn't matter that much, then the threshold will be lower. And if it matters a lot, then the threshold will be higher. But either way, you still need to have enough confidence to cross that decision threshold, regardless of how high it is. Now, if you actually do know a little bit about it, so this is the biohazard sign. If you know that down the road, on the right road of the fork, there is danger. So if you have evidence of danger, you have more knowledge, 
then it actually decreases the ambiguity, reduces it, and it increases the clarity, which results in an increase in confidence. So now you have a bit more justification for going down one road instead of another. And this naturally develops, this confidence, when you have sufficient clarity. And so once you have enough confidence to make the decision, at least enough knowledge to decide that you don't want to go down one road, but you do want to go down the right road, you've kind of achieved the goal of data science in a nutshell. And this is the minimum viable product of any informatic tool that's used, especially within a pharmaceutical or, or any kind of setting actually when decisions are being made. Now the question is, how do we automate the reduction of this ambiguity so that we can eliminate these hypotheses quickly, to quickly identify which road to go down and which road not to go down? In order to get to that answer, there's one more concept that's required in order to build this tool for rapidly making decisions at scale, and it's computational reasoning via ontologies. Now to introduce this, um, I want to call your attention to one of the best movies of all time, in my humble opinion, and uh, it's The Matrix. And so there's this quote from the movie, The Matrix is everywhere. Now there's a deep cut version of this movie where Morpheus goes on a little bit more and he actually says ontologies are everywhere. And then he actually talks a little bit more about it and he explains exactly what he means by that, which is that ontologies are dictionaries that can be used programmatically. They're controlled vocabularies and they're hierarchical defining relationships. That is not what he said in the movie, but I thought I would throw it in there anyway. Um, but to explain a bit more about what I mean by ontologies and how actually literally everyone listening to this, everyone not listening to this, already has ontologies in their head and uses them all the time, I'll go into a conceptual example. So imagine we have someone named Kai here. Kai is a, uh, a scientist, and before working on the next experiment, Kai says, well, today for lunch, I wanna have a vegetarian meal without leaving a carbon footprint and be back to the lab in an hour. So the question is, which restaurant should Kai choose? Well, in order to build this decision-making tool, if we wanted to do this computationally, we would need computational reasoning. But before talking about the computational reasoning, let's go through a little bit about how Kai would do this manually using human reasoning. So let's say this is the map near where Kai's lab is, right? And so Kai is actually located in, in this region of the map. So what Kai can immediately tell, since Kai was looking for a vegetarian meal, well, Carl's Caribbean, Caribbean food is uh, omnivorous. My family's from the Virgin Islands. I have a lot of pride in that, and there's lots of great food there, but it's not always vegetarian or vegan. And since Kai is looking for vegetarian food, that eliminates Caribbean food. It also eliminates chicken. Um, it also eliminates steak. It also eliminates seafood. Now, there's one other part here. Um, Kai said, uh, be back within an hour. So you can see on this map that Kai would have to take this road all the way out, actually off map, and then come back. It's a really long route. So if Kai tries to do it without doing a, uh, generating a carbon footprint, um, then Kai would have to walk all this way or ride a bike, and that would just take too long. So Kai wouldn't get back in time for the hour uh, limit. Um, but then if Kai wants to get there quickly, then Kai would have to use a, an automobile, um, which would generate a carbon footprint. But then there's, so that eliminates Val's veggies. But then there's another path here. So there's this footbridge that Kai can walk across or ride a bike across to get to the voracious vegan, which serves vegan food, which would also include vegetarian food. So Kai would end up going with the voracious vegan. And you can see that this is what Kai would have generated manually. So this is human reasoning. Now, how could we build software that does the same exact thing? So this is where we would apply computational reasoning, also called semantics. So you already have in your head, I'm going to draw out an ontology, but you already know all of this anyway, who, regardless of who you are, what your domain is, whether you're a programmer or not. So there's a notion of menu types, right? And so you've got meat-based and you've got plant-based, right? And then the, the meat-based menus would include all, so that would be that omnivorous uh, Caribbean food. And then you've got your chicken, you've got steak, you've got seafood. But then, in terms of the plant-based, you've got vegetarian and you've got vegan. And you, one might argue that vegetarian might be a subtype of vegan, but for simplicity's sake, we'll say that they're two separate versions. But if Kai said that Kai wants a vegetarian meal, then we know that we don't want anything meat-based. 
So, um, and by the way, so this whole thing is an example of an ontology. So this is a directed acyclic graph. It goes in one direction. So it's directed, it goes in one direction, and it's acyclic, it has no loops. Um, and this is a graph, so nodes, these circles, and then edges, the connections between them. So if Kai said, I don't want anything meat-based because I want vegetarian, then that eliminates meat-based and everything that's a child of meat-based. So computationally, if we have access to this ontology, by eliminating this, we eliminate this entire chunk of the table here. And that leaves Val's veggies and the voracious vegan because they're both plant-based. So Kai still needs to be able to pick one restaurant to go to. So then how would Kai do that? Well, why not use another ontology and use these annotations represented by the dotted lines. These are the associations between this controlled hierarchical vocabulary and then the catalog of entities here. So the restaurants are different entities. So what if we use another ontology computationally here so we can do the computational reasoning? So you're also already familiar with this, transportation types. So you've got pollutive transportation types. And what is meant by that? Well, you've got private or public. Private being a personal car or a ride share. And ironically, what we just heard in the background, the train that goes down to Grand Central Station, for example, is public transportation, but it's not carbon neutral. And neither is a bus. Um, and then also, we have carbon neutral options, biking or walking. Now, we mentioned before that Val's Veggies requires Kai to go very far. So either you take a long time, which is unacceptable, or you have to use a car, which is unacceptable by this ontology uh, elimination here. So now we know that Val's Veggies is invalid too because it, it's pollutive, which leaves only one option, the voracious vegan, because it has a footbridge that allows Kai to get the lunch and then come back within a reasonable amount of time. Now, of course, and now, as you kind of may have gotten an understanding of what an ontology is, you're well aware that there are other types of ontology graphs that could have been used. So in terms of terrain, or traffic, or price, or what have you. So this was a computationally reasoned lunch recommendation. There was an ontology, so a, a hierarchy of definitions or dictionary types that can describe different types of methods. There's one that can describe mechanisms and one that can describe destinations. And it allowed Kai to eliminate a bunch of hypotheses of whatever XYZ restaurants could have uh, met all of Kai's requirements. So it allowed Kai to identify which restaurant to find. Um, and then this could also be scaled. So in the event that you have way more than just five or six restaurants, if you have a hundred or a thousand, you can still use computational reasoning to address larger sets just like you can smaller sets. So you can also apply this computational reasoning to biomedicine as well in terms of diseases, for example. So the human phenotype ontology is an ontology that exists and it represents the relationships between terms describing human aberrations and diseases. And it was published initially by Peter Robinson and Melissa Handel back in 2008. It's got 10,000 plus characteristics that they identified um, structurally and hierarchically by reading through the contents of OMIM, the Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man database, which is a list of genetic diseases observed in people and the phenotypes that are uh, identified by the, the clinicians and the geneticists who have studied these diseases. Of course, there are a bounty of other public ontologies that can describe other types of entities, be they uh, genes, diseases, um, cohorts of people, and annotations, remember those dotted lines between the hierarchical vocabularies and the catalogs also exist as well, which facilitates the uh, application of computationally reasoned hypothesis recommendation, which is what was done for this Intermap project. And of course, just like with the lunch selection, it can be applied to increasingly, increasingly complex hypotheses across massive biomedical catalogs. So the way that was done in the Intermap target detector, which is the screenshot that I showed initially, was combining R with Plumber. Plumber is an R package that allows for the construction of APIs that allow for a software, a piece of software that you can write to interact with a bunch of other types of resources and then return results without needing to, for example, share passwords. Um, and so there are a lot of benefits there because you can keep the data locked down and you can minimize inadvertent modifications of the data. And then also Shiny. So Shiny, as many of you are well aware, is a 
package that allows for the development of interactive web applications right out of the box. And so by combining these things, I was able to generate the interface, the intermap target detector. And so now a little bit more using the colors from the previous slides, you can, what the intermap target detector results show are a way to filter down to the method of intervention and filtering down to the mechanism, the molecular abnormality, and identifying the disease, the set of phenotypic presentations that are present in patients. So now that we're getting a bit more into the data-driven aspect of it, I'm gonna talk more about this data-driven approach for overcoming the obstacles to selecting hypotheses and using R to do this. So the approach is threefold. First, build a living knowledge base of biomedical entities, ontologies, and their relationships, those annotations between them. Um, and then build a programmatic association mining connection and do this via an API, an application programming interface to that knowledge base and then build a user-friendly interface for querying the connection um, and then explaining the reasoning behind these recommendations. And I was able to do this using Neo4j, um, which is a graph database technology. As I mentioned before, those graphs, those nodes and edges, uh, and then the annotations between them, they're in the structure of a graph. And so Neo4j is built from the ground up for understanding these types of relational uh, data sets. And then Plumber is what I used for constructing that API that can interface with the Neo4j graph database and then provide results to the Shiny app. And so actually thinking about this, this is very close to the MVC, also known as Model View Controller design pattern of building tools. And so what do I mean by that? Well, so the model is a representation of the data, the actual storage of the data. And then the view is how a human being, an end user, might interact with the tool directly or indirectly. And the controller is actually what separates the two so that the user, the human being, can interface with the view, which will send requests to the controller, which will send requests to the model. So what ends up happening, for example, is Kai might open up the Shiny app and which is a graphical user interface, a GUI. And so the user questions that Kai generates within the GUI are sent to the controller. And then the controller, which is an API, application programming interface, actually sends its request over to the model, which contains the stored data and relationships. And the model returns the data subset, which the API structures in a way that can be sent back and represented within the Shiny app in a user-friendly method. So an advantage of this is that it separates and organizes application data into end and code into distinct manageable components. And it also makes it easier to add and debug functionality to just one component without needing to dig through or modify the entire code base, which also makes it better for collaborative and tandem programming and helps to minimize code clashes, which is a great way to future-proof data sets and code projects. In order to do this particular code project, though, a lot of resources were needed. So data from the NCBI, the National Center for Biotechnology Information, the IMBC, International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, and OMIM, Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man, um, those organizations have data that I was able to extract. So the gene ontology, mammalian phenotype, human phenotype ontology, and also a, an interesting and very useful additional ontology, which is the euphino ontology. So the euphino ontology has relationships between the mammalian descriptions, so non-human mammals, and the human. So in a way, so I live in a, in a bilingual household, so I kind of think of it as Spanglish. It allows you to use computational reasoning in a, reasoning in a way that lets you think in multiple ontologies and languages. Um, so the Neo4j graph database is for storing these catalogs, and then the construction and optimization of the code in the cipher language that Neo4j uses for querying the data um, can be done using R, initially directly, but then eventually dynamically using R. And then semantic similarity is a part of computational reasoning that can be used to help the computer identify potential effective or likely effective therapeutic hypotheses. Um, and then construction of the interactive API first web tool, the shiny web tool that uses the API in order to provide data to the end users, be they wet lab biologists or 
uh, computational um, data scientists like myself. So to discuss a bit more about the knowledge base um, and how the construction of increasingly complex cipher queries were achieved with R. Um, so this is actually what the data model looks like. This is what's stored inside of the Neo4j graph database. So right off the bat, there are three ontologies that are used, just like the ontology of restaurant types and the ontology of transportation types, we've got an ontology of genes. So this is the gene ontology, this is the human phenotype ontology, and these are mammalian phenotype ontologies. Phenotypes are just aberrations in terms of how the physical presentation is deviations from wild type in a, in a nutshell. Um, and then you've also got these genes here and these also, there are interactions between the protein products of these genes. And then genes are known to contain variants that cause human diseases as well. And then the relationships between human diseases and the human phenotype ontology, the Spanglish relationships between human phenotype and mammalian phenotype, and the relationships between mouse models that were generated and the mammalian phenotypes that were observed from them. Now the thing I really would need to point out here is the relationship here, this, this Spanglish relationship between human phenotype and mammalian phenotype. This is the interspecies aspect and it's where the name um, intermap came from. So intermap is interspecies mapping of biomedical data. And so the reason why interspecies mapping is important within a knowledge base is, well, when you think about what's done within a pharmaceutical company, you know that you're targeting a human disease or a phenotype set. That's the goal, to eliminate that phenotype set that is experienced by patients suffering from a disease, right? And you know that that disease is caused by variations in human genotype. But in order to study that, you make modifications to the genotype of model organisms. So you might make one to a mouse genotype in order to generate mouse, a mouse model that has a phenotype set that is analogous, similar to the human phenotype set. And then hopefully you generate a therapeutic treatment that can intervene on that aberrant mouse genotype in order to reduce the phenotype set that is present within the mouse model. And then ultimately you hope to apply this in clinical trials and then if everything goes well you can use this to intervene on human genotype to reduce the initial human disease but the problem is that you start with human and then you go to mouse and then you go to mouse and then you go back to human and so not considering human phenotypes directly throughout the entire process could be disadvantageous and result in a pharmaceutical company potentially spending time and resources going down a path that ultimately is not going to work so it may be better instead of going human, mouse, mouse, human, as I have done here, to go human, 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 human. And this is something that can be done potentially with the UFENO mapping between human phenotype ontology annotations to entities like human disease and mammalian phenotype ontology annotations and their entities, uh, their annotations to entities like mice. And this could help to increase the chances of getting an effective therapeutic target. So to come back to this, now that it's pretty, hopefully I've established the benefit of having this similarity relationship here between human and mammalian ontologies and their annotations to their respective entities, be they diseases or mice or other types of model organisms, you can see that thousands and thousands of nodes, these circles, have been stored already inside of the graph database. And then there are almost a million connections, these edges here, connections between the circles that exist within the graph database as well. So what I ended up doing was using direct cipher to build queries to pull some of this data out. Now that the uh, ontologies and the annotations to entities are present within the database, now um, what I did was build queries to in a, in a sense, do what I described before with Kai and identifying what is the best way to um, get a vegetarian meal in a hurry. Um, so I built direct cipher queries and then I also used R to dynamically generate cipher queries and then send those to the Neo4j graph database using the Neo4R package. So for example, what I did 
for this was identify the orthologs. So these are these goldenrod nodes are human genes and they have orthologs to mouse genes. So NAT2, for example. Um, and so I was able to use this ASCII art, that's what it's called, Cypher is written in ASCII art, to ask Neo4j for uh, the first five pairs of gene orthologs. Another thing that I can do is do this interspecies translation. Now, for example, um, and I've been mentioning this before, the utility of interspecies uh, translations, the Spanglish translation, um, the uh, blue sclera, for example, is what is seen in the eye when the sclera, which is the white of the eye, is thin. And this is because the vitreous fluid inside of the eye is, um, is dark because so much light is absorbed by the retina. So what actually happens, what's seen in human beings suffering from diseases that give them thin sclera, it's called blue sclera in the disease circles of people who study and are familiar with human disease. But when evaluated in non-human mammals, it's called scleral thinning. And so the Euphino ontology has these similarity mappings between blue sclera, scleral thinning, and a whole bunch of other analogous or equivalent um, ontological terms. Another one here is, so the red dots are diseases and the yellow are human genes. So I wrote a query that identified all monogenic diseases, diseases that are known to be caused by variants in only one gene. And that also have genes that are orthologs that when those genes are knocked out in mice do not cause lethality in those model organism mice. So this is what this image is showing. You can see that there are a lot of diseases in the OMIM catalog, the Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man catalog, and they have just one gene known to contain a causal variant. So if we wrap all of this up together, then we can have another pharmaceutical example, which is ultimately what powers the Intermap target detector. So Kai is a scientist, as I mentioned before, is a biologist and aims to remedy disease using a therapeutic intervention technique that works well at targeting ER, endoplasmic reticulum lumen proteins, and thereby genetic diseases caused by loss of function variants to ER lumen genes, genes that code for those proteins. The treatment also needs to be testable in-house so that it can be relatively straightforward to generate the disease model, and the knockout of the causal disease of the causal gene needs to be non-lethal and also there should be sufficient time to intervene before the onset of the disease. So as with the lunch order and, and plan, now what should Kai do? Which disease and mechanism should Kai decide to target? Well, this is also something that's doable as well, leveraging the ontologies that were stored in the graph database and the catalogs to which annotations have also been stored in the graph database. I was able to generate a query using all of this data from these different organizations to represent a solution here. So you can see here that there are actually seven nodes. Um, and these seven nodes are diseases, these red nodes. And then there are um, uh, other types of annotations to them as well. So, for example, the blue are the mammalian phenotype ontology annotations to mice that were generated by knockouts of the gene that is known to contain causal variants that causes the red, the disease. And so this is the intermap subgraph for endoplasmic reticulum lumen gene ontology term queries. And so what this actually looks like in terms of cipher queries is this long 37 line cipher query. It's actually written in cipher, not R, but this can be used to generate the kinds of results that I sh just showed on the previous slide. Now, keeping that thought in mind, this is where the API comes in because those 37 lines can now be encapsulated within an R function and the R function can receive parameters that inject so you can see here and here well here and here and here in different parts of the cipher query 
the inputs for the function can be used to populate and tweak how the question is asked of the data inside of the graph database. And then if you can make that function into an API endpoint, now you can build an entire API and you can have different types of endpoints that ask those types of questions. So this was built using Plumber and then published to our RStudio Connect server using the RS Connect package. And so APIs also allow for fair principles of good collaboration. So fair principles mean findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. In a nutshell, it facilitates great collaboration and the expansion of tools so that additional questions can be asked as well. So to talk about the interface now, the graph database stores the data. The API accesses the data. The API accesses the data, and now the Shiny app accesses the API. And so that's exactly what this is and it allows for the focus on rapidly providing both multi-omic hypotheses and the computational reasoning behind them. Now, for example, if Kai asks for endoplasmic reticulum lumen as the gene ontology term, that's important because remember, the intervention method works really well with proteins that are associated with endoplasmic reticulum lumen. So if Kai asks for that, Kai notices immediately in the results that seroid lipofusinosis adult onset has adult onset, meaning that it happens later in life, which could mean that there is sufficient time to intervene therapeutically. So now actually if I click this link, we can see interactively, so this is a live demo of what's happening here. This is what Kai would see, for example. So we see adult onset um, seroid lipofusinosis is a disease. Now before digging into some of these results, I can click here and see what the computer is understanding the computational reasoning behind it. So Kai selected endoplasmic reticulum lumen, as you can see here in this VisNet interactive graphic. And um, what uh, can also be seen is this is the specific term that was selected, but then there are general terms that are also selected as well because of computational reasoning. The computer knows that not only do diseases or genes associated with this term, uh, should they appear in the results, but also genes associated with any of the um, more specific versions of the term as well. For example, cortical endoplasmic reticulum lumen is a more specific version of endoplasmic reticulum lumen. You can also see here, in terms of CLN6, you can see other annotations, other gene ontology annotations to the um, gene. Oop, okay, let me see, right here. So other gene ontology annotations to this mouse gene, and then you can click them and you can see more information here on the JAX website about this gene ontology term. Similarly, you can see information about which mammalian phenotype ontology terms were observed inside of the CLN6 gene knockout mouse. Um, you can also see gene ontology terms annotated to the human gene ortholog of the CLN6 gene. And then you can also see the phenotypes observed in patients suffering from seroid lipofusinosis, uh, which is caused by variants in the CLN6 gene. And you can see adult onset is one of them. And there are these other phenotypes as well that might be remedied if some sort of targeting on the mechanism in which uh, CLN6 functionality has gone awry occurs. So to skip ahead to the, so in, in a nutshell, um, this is what can be done by integrating all of this information together and then making it accessible via a Shiny app. So, um, let's see. So, in conclusion, um, what I've discussed is a way to use computational reasoning within R to eliminate obstacles to scientific process by helping biologists and my fellow uh, data scientists prevent the mechanism by preventing sorry, prevent the mechanism in order to prevent the disease. And of course, the intermap approach is just a starting point. There are many other uses, including drug repurposing, clinical diagnostics in genetic disease patients, and there are a whole variety of others. I've done a similar type of approach in the past uh, to integrate uh, clinical, in to integrate multiomic data in order to help accelerate and facilitate clinical diagnostics. And so this is what I did with a tool called OMIM Explorer. I published it um, in the lab that I was in at Baylor um, a couple of years back, and you can use the QR code to go to it, um, but, or to go to a video tutorial series. But essentially, I applied semantic similarity analysis techniques to a biomedical knowledge base on the fly to help clinical geneticists decide on phenotype-based 
um, exome filter diagnoses for patients. So integrating a whole bunch of different data types in order to help increase the confidence that uh, the clinical geneticists would have in making decisions. And it was an R-based Shiny app that used an older version of the Plumber API package and MySQL instead of Neo4j as the data backend for caching. It's a proof of concept only, but you can build a similar tool in your own environment by following along with the publication in Genome Medicine from 2016. So I would like to thank um, a whole host of people who helped with uh, the work involved in this presentation, people on my team, people who helped with the um, evaluation of these slides, and also, of course, the R and Pharma organizi organizing committee. So thank you very much. I'm not sure if there's time for questions, but thank you. That was fantastic. That was a really interesting uh, talk, Regis. Um, we have a 10 minute break, yep. um, basically scheduled up until uh, 11 o'clock. Uh, I'm looking for questions on, on the channel. Um, let's see, Q&A, we've got a couple. Uh, Mm, one good question. Is it hard to combine and manage all the different public data repositories? Obviously, you're using a graph database, maybe even like the versioning of that. What, how's that going? Or how's that process? That's a very fair question. And we've done um, quite a bit of thinking about that. Right now, these are just fixed versions. So it's the latest as of when I ran the cron job to download everything. Um, but you can think of, there are permutations, right? Like you can have a version of the gene ontology that's from this week, but then a version of the mammalian phenotype ontology from last week. And then the question is, to what degree do we allow the questioning of this data um, to be curated based on versioning at all? Or do we just do snapshot at a given time and then a snapshot at another given time? Right now, I don't have versioning incorporated into it but it is something that can be considered. Um, and especially if you do something like this in your own ecosystem at whatever pharmaceutical company you work at, you can also, um, so Neo4j is a labeled property graph type of graph database. So you can include metadata in the annotations to these nodes and also the edges. So you can say this edge, this association between the gene and the, this gene ontology term, for example, was made this week. But then you can say this node, the relationship between this node and this node, or the even existence of this node at all, is from last month. So you can actually include timestamps in the queries for Neo4j. And then you can, of course, do this dynamically in the R that's generated using the API and then connect that to the Shiny app and make that a drop down menu option. There's lots of possibility. Very cool, very cool. And I won't say anything about the pun of Neo for Neo4j. Oh, no, they did this on purpose, which is why I love them so much. <laughs> They did this on purpose. There is a package inside of Neo4j, kind of like there's Tidyverse in R. There's a package in Neo4j called APOC. I'm not kidding you. They did this on purpose. And they have it on their website. They did this on purpose. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I think that this would be a really good candidate for sessions afterwards and app. Also, just ongoing discussion, because this is a really cool tool and it's a very cool application of a lot of different topics. I'm, I feel like I've learned Kung Fu just in a quick second. So, um, so I'm going to give everybody uh, five um, minutes right before Max's talk. But Regis, thank you so much for that. That was a brilliant presentation. I really enjoyed it. I think everybody else on behalf of the group would really appreciate that. Thank awesome. you. Thank you.